in Hawaii or do that kind of powerful thing. And somehow I will find myself in this forever kind of way. I'll just become this perfect person or I will just become this full version of myself in this perfect, never ending way. And of course, it's not as simple as that. And there's also this fantasy that growth will mean expansion or light or continued adventure. But frequently growth means facing the painful things that for survival reasons, you had to compartmentalize when you were young, the things you had to put to one side, otherwise you might not have made it. So frequently there's this sort of painful realization. You know, I'm not exactly a walking advert for working with me, am I? But frequently I'm there to hold this meaningful disillusioning stance with people about the adaptive strategies that they developed when they were young to deal with life's tensions, to deal with their parents, to deal with their families, to deal with school and teachers and society. And these parts of themselves that they couldn't cope with, they turned away from. And frequently self-knowledge is to turn back and look back at those things that you turned away from. And that's not pretty, Anna. You know, that's not fun. That doesn't feel like I just found myself in this never-ending meadow of white light kind of feeling, you know. And that's the tough, re rewarding work that I do a lot of the time because if you can understand your developmental filters, if you can understand what shaped you prior to age seven, if you like, the fundamental sort of tenant of depth psychology is that you are shaped by fundamental developmental experiences before you're fully conscious of it, which obviously has huge implications for the question around the meaning of astrology with children or parents. Yes. But That's I find my, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just I mean, need to pause for a second because sure. I think something happened with our broadcast. Okay. Jimmy, are, are we live? We are live. Okay, great. I just got a alarming message from... Jamie, that we had to reset. So I just wanted to make sure that we don't we don't have this juicy conversation without anybody being able to benefit from it. Okay, so let's dive right back in, Mark. Um, yes, what what you're bringing up about this unique experience that you get to bring to the table of working with people through those childhood. Um, traumas and, and things that get built up in childhood, it's such a key <laughs> in why I'm very driven to be having these conversations specifically about children and supporting children. And I would love to know more from your perspective, how your experience and your lens into seeing people in this space wanting to do all of this healing and having to do the hard work, how that's framed your own transition into fatherhood. How, how has that informed your decisions as a father? Well, I mean, that's a massive question in a way. Um, and I'm not even sure we would have the scope if we spent the entire time answering it in one way. I mean, to address the personal thing of being a father, there's no prep. It doesn't matter if you've been a therapist for years or if you've studied all these different charts. There's no preparation for that moment. It is fundamentally a life initiation. You are fundamentally initiated when it happens to you. I had the fortune to be able to catch my daughter as she came out. And from the moment this tiny little being landed in the palms of my hands and this, you know, huge gravity, like, like a little mini asteroid had landed in the palms of my hand, I knew that, you know, fundamentally love and responsibility would be intertwined for the rest of my life, that I had total love and total responsibility for this small being. Now, that's an initiation that you're either ready for and I can't say I was 100% ready for, you know, you're purifying the parts of you that can't quite take that in, 
because it's so enormous. But, you know, you, I have a great enormous sympathy or compassion for those people where it happens to them earlier in life or with lack of preparation. And the initiatory power of that love and responsibility hits them and they're knocked sideways. Um, <clears throat> you know, particularly at having a tendency to bring up unresolved feelings with one's own parents or one's own childhood. But I mean, I had a very pure experience of knowing in the first five minutes of my daughter's life, as she lay on my shoulder and my wife, who'd been through 23 hours of labor, fainted and, and, a, and a kind of team, a, a, a medical emergency team came into the room. So we have this surreal thing, like an episode of uh, Grey's Anatomy or some sort of medical ER drama going on. And this little gravitational rock of a Taurus lying on my shoulder, pressing me into the chair. And just this feeling of like, I hope everything's okay, but I have to stay here with this tiny being. Um, so personal fatherhood elevated through an initiatory process, if you like, the understanding of the developmental material. And it's brought me back into working with clients and in the master classes I teach. And when I teach about developmental psychology and astrology, it's made it real again, fundamentally real again. And I'm also watching it happen in this tiny little being. I'm watching her go through those processes. Does that mean I handle her tantrums better than the next man or woman? Not necessarily. You know, am I am I immune from the vicissitudes of her emotional roller coaster just because I have some understanding of the developmental process? It helps, but it doesn't it doesn't take you out of those challenging moments as a parent where you have to carry on loving this being who's woken you up for the second or third time that night or has just weed all over her bedding or whatever it is. You know, so in a, in one sense, the greatest gift that astrology can do is to produce self knowledge in the parent as to the nature of their own natal chart dynamics, so that they are a strong, psychically mature person, because that's fundamentally what the child needs. The easiest way to fail your child is simply to fail yourself, and then that yeah ricochets down yeah that right there that's gold for sure and i i just first of all i want to thank you for being candid and sharing your honest experience of what it's like to become a parent i think a lot of us can really kind of put ourselves on a hook and not let ourselves off when we have all of these uh, dreams and goals and expectations of ourselves, when we really go in with a conscious intention into parenting, I mean, into anything, but into parenting with all of these desires to just wanna be our absolute best selves and not do it like our parents did. And, and then often, probably every time, we have the very real wake up of what, how messy it is, no, no matter what. And that that's part of the process. And um, one wonders, Anna, almost yes. if even look, clearly some parents fail children in very profound ways through lack of love or, or through trauma or abuse. But one wonders if even the most loving parent has to, to some extent, fail in the face of that deeper mission, that deeper love, that deeper responsibility, uh, some of the time just to allow the child the reparative experience, the, the shock to their individuality, the shock that there isn't just complete congruence all the time, there isn't just complete rapport, this parent of mine isn't just completely tracking me and loving me in every moment. Maybe that even uh, triggers the child's individuality or the spark, you know, like um, hitting a hammer on an anvil or something, a spark comes through the conflict or through the lack of understanding. And maybe that spark's central to their individuality. We can't even be sure. But as a parent, sometimes you're so like twisted up about it, don't aren't you? you just, you just, a loving parent wants the best. They want to be in this rapport and life is this series of lessons of how it doesn't work out like that 
half the time, you know? Yeah. So this brings me to, of course, the main topic that we're discussing, which is, well, it's related to the, the our topic today, the parent-child dynamic. Can you talk about how we come together in these very particular patterns and these very particular um, with particular mission together with our children it's it's as you're saying it's like we're wired to have challenges in order to grow through the experience it's almost like that's what the purpose of the the whole thing is well and that's a very challenging thing isn't it for initially for a parent to uh, address i remember in the first couple of weeks of my daughter's life uh, myself a person who is mainly transcended astrological paranoia you know cosmic paranoia staring at your chart and worrying about things or thinking about yourself in a certain way something i teach my students really to try and overcome and yet i found myself doing it with my daughter's chart because of course i love her so much the preciousness i felt attached i wanted things to work out for her and then a former client of mine contacted me who'd also become a father and he was in that process, but to a debilitating extent, he looked at his boy's chart and he couldn't function, this young man, he couldn't, he was so concerned about what might happen. He was you know, terrified of what could happen to this boy. And I was able to use some of my own experience in those few days to reassure him, to talk about, you know, effectively, although you are very important as a child's parent, their life fate, their daimon, their soul, their karma, however you want to frame it, the individual uh, life journey that they're on, that they hold in their soul memory exists also separate from you. There is a paradox. Um, uh, a, a Dutch girl I knew when I was a teenager called it, you know, you're born a little bit of your father, a little bit of your mother and a little piece of sky, you know, you bring your own unique thing with you. And we can't, um, you can't take that away from the child. And that's partly what that spark of individuality when we when we miss them produces in them that free song of them being themselves sort of free of you but then your question's so complicated in another way because i mean there's just super simple stuff isn't there like where your chart falls in regard to your child's chart which is just just the synastry alone for example could help you understand where certain conflicts arise and i've helped a lot of people um, you know, with a combination of that, trying to understand their child and their behavior, but also looking at the child's chart from a certain point of view of, shall we say, having come back or been here before and what they carry. So astrology can help in, the, in this incredible number of ways, but the, the idea that it's going to answer something this is the way I see it, right? Astrology is like a map. And the danger is, right, you're sat there in front of the Grand Canyon in your Jeep that you've driven there with friends, looking at the map instead of staring at the beauty of the Grand Canyon. The living experience of you with your child supersedes the astrology. The astrology exists there for those subtle moments of reflection, those nuances, those thinking back. My daughter has both Moon and Venus in Cancer. She's extraordinarily sensitive. I get to remind myself of her sensitivity. Moon, Venus, and Cancer in the eighth, and and Neptune on the IC. Just all this water in her, all this incredible sensitivity. The way that my daughter feels love for animals or for me and my wife is incredibly. So there's all these, I, th I think it's an incredibly complex subject, what you're asking in a way, because we can learn to appreciate the other individual. We can learn to see how the two charts interconnect we could look at the composite for the kind of purpose but for me all of that occurs in like a soulful place yeah because otherwise it's all so fraught i've just watched you know new parents looking at the child's chart and i've had to help a number of them like i had to help myself calm down and not worry about it not take it 
too seriously learn to go with what that child the chart is like a combination isn't it that has to be held all the time with the emergent properties of the child themselves like a flower it's like you should never forget the flower the kindergarten flower so you should always hold the child's actual being alongside the chart so you don't abstract what they might be or what they're seeking and if i may share one image that's meant a lot to me and i've been using with a lot of the people i work with in a sense your role as a parent is to facilitate your child's rainbow if we can liken the multi-dimensional self to a rainbow the child is born with a rainbow and the tragedy of some parenting households some some early childhood experiences is that the parents have already lost some of the rainbow they've already lost a parent through their own experiences their own trauma has already shut down orange and red and by three or four that child's struggling to keep orange and red alive and you know if there was one single great gift you could give your child it would be to keep the rainbow as bright and as alive as possible for as long as possible and you could use astrology in that sense to overcome your own filters would be the ideal wouldn't it or prejudices so that you could understand the particular rainbow embodied in this little being that's different from you that expresses things differently from you that's a gorgeous analogy i love that thank you so much for bringing that in well it sounds like there can be some serious pitfalls if we don't use astrology mindfully when we're trying to use it in our parenting and there's something that you said earlier that one of the biggest mistakes that we can make as parents and let our children down is to not and i'm paraphrasing of course is to not not fulfill ourselves exactly exactly and then compensate for that lack of fulfillment of self by overstudying the chart or what's the danger conceptually with astrology generally there's two ways that you could use the potential understanding you could use it to free people you could use it to get people to have an experience of something beyond themselves to lead to something um, truly opening or you can use astrology to imprison people and you do that with a child you start getting into too many nitpicking analyses of exactly how their moon in virgo and it's in conjunct to saturn might play out to a two-year-old or a three-year-old and you're in danger of restricting something about their growth aren't you you're in danger of missing something that they could teach you about the uniqueness of that aspect yeah I would be I would be very concerned about people trying to apply too many astrological filters and interpretive filters to small children. Especially with, you know, I think a lot of our audience is not necessarily very well versed in astrology. So as someone that's interested in astrology, it sounds like going right to the child's chart and starting to figure out what's wrong or what um what the big what the big mission is for your child yes yes what they're meant to be, exactly or, or what the biggest challenge it's going is going to be those those are some some things we definitely want to steer clear of so for some which is that, which is a message anna isn't it for astrology generally in a way I try to hold that stance with my clients. When I do readings, even with adults, I try not to immediately go to their life mission or purpose from an abstract reading of their chart. I try to let them be like the emergent rose, like the child, because otherwise you're in danger of pre-conceptualizing someone's unique purpose. And what's the chances of you, no matter how gifted an astrologer you are, understanding the mystery of someone's spiritual purpose, just, just like that? You have to be so careful, it seems to me, the way you hold these things, the way you you either use astrology as an invitation for a person to be more of themselves, or you're at risk 
you're at risk of conceptualizing them before they've even been it, before they've even done it. So I would say that the way you could hold it with a small child also teaches you something about how you could use astrology with adults to be less interpretive, less prescriptive, less in a rush to tell people who they are or what they do in a way. Yeah. That's wonderful. Actually, Amanda was just having a really great and related conversation with Rick Levine yesterday about some of the misuses of astrology. And w one of the ways is clearly putting people in a box, like rather than expanding what is available to them is overly confining them to some rigid idea of what it means to have sun in Scorpio or exactly or and it is as simple as that even just saying yeah sun in Scorpio you're intense or sun in Libra your life's all about relationships even that kind of relatively simple association of astrology could be prescriptive or damaging to someone or miss something about them but when you get to the level which I've seen with some astrologers where a person's literally saying you know, the astrologer's going, oh, you had a distant relationship with your father. I can see the parental struggle. And the client's going, no, I didn't. You know, me and my dad had a couple of conflicts, but we worked them through. I love him. He remained in my life. And the astrologer's going, no, you're just denying it to yourself because, you know, the chart or whatever it is. I've heard those things. I mean, that that's, I mean, I, I won't say any more because people would be able to identify who it was. But, you know, that's, a, that's an example I personally observed in my 20s that is someone coming out of a reading telling with a famous astrologer telling me how the reading went and it's not like a made-up story there are people all the time that literally have the astrologer ride roughshod over them and say no that's not how your life went anna i can see from your chart you're just deluding yourself your life went like this and that is amazing really it's mind-blowing really what that does and you imagine any version of that, any temptation of the mind to do that with a small child is akin to a form of psychic avoidance of the child's reality and could become mildly abusive at some point if you were, if, if you were really um, conceptually hung up about astrology. So what, what do we do with this firecracker of a tool? You know, we've got this incredible multidimensional tool. We love our kids and we want to look at their charts and feel that sense of hope and that... Because I will say this, it's better to have those positive fantasies about your child than no fantasies. I think Hillman made this point brilliantly in a book, in one of his books. Um, the parent that doesn't have any fantasies for their child is effectively denying them a form of psychic love. If you love your child, you have some kind of fantasy for them or dream for them. We have to just be careful as parents that we don't tilt their unique self-expression to fit our version of the dream that it that it actually becomes from an emergent property in them and i think astrology can help with that too in a weird kind of way astrology if you could hold it right would be a lens to look at your child's unique self and and to somehow maybe even step past your own filters about how they should be Because I don't know, Anna, you, you must know this. Parental love's dangerous, isn't it, in a way? Parental love's like a rabbit hole. When you're really caught in it, it can really do things to you. You know, it's really the preciousness. I realized as soon as my daughter was born that I was more attached to this life, that I was more, you know, that I was thinking long term. I was thinking like, because I'm an older dad, I was thinking like, how can I set things up? so that me not being here at a certain time is okay in this little being's world. I was thinking like that from within a few months of becoming a father. That, it became more important for me to follow that than even, yeah, anything else in a way. Well, that's a very interesting way to put it, that it's, it's dangerous. Um, I would say, one of the traps that I found myself falling into pretty intensely was my just painful desire to want to protect my son from pain at all costs. 
and want to shield him from all the things in in the world that I felt were not right for that like pure, beautiful little being that just came in with all his channels open and and one of my biggest lessons and opportunity for growth so far and there have been so many has been to step back and really allow for the for his experience to evolve and include those painful and uncomfortable things because I wasn't here to just create a bubble for him. I, I'm here to offer him support and guidance and nurturance, but I cannot keep him from the world. And this fantasy that I had that I would be able to keep him from pain. Well, it's a beautiful fantasy and I understand it totally. It comes from the preciousness of parental love. <clears throat> and the specific personal attachment you feel for this tiny being that you've nursed and you and you've brought into the world i mean it's so powerful and it's also a huge part of the feminine mystery and gift to life isn't it the, the actual birth process itself and, and nursing the intimacy of that of course in some ways you could say couldn't you archetypally mother is in that place keeping them safe and archetypally or traditionally father would also be loving would but would be a little bit more like all right well you know some rough and tumble or these things might happen but we'll get over it to balance that preciousness of maternal love because i think it's very natural but it is part of the challenge isn't it as soon as you're a parent you're more attached and then you realize the attachment could hurt your child in time that if you had had the ability let's say you've been a multi-billionaire heiress living in this massive estate in Montecito and just all this life and you could keep your child almost literally in a bubble the whole time. It could destroy them, couldn't it? It could destroy their capacity to meet the world. So you see that that's the edge of parental love. It, you realize it leads you to some dark places through its beauty, through its incredible power to just hit you in the heart. I mean, I can't bear the few times my daughter has some cat scratches which i pray to god will go on her forehead from the time that i failed as a father to introduce her to the local tam cat in a in a proper way and she loves animals and you know for months afterwards i would see these scratches healing on her forehead and feel sick just that i hadn't done that that one moment right just for one split second and i mean just god bless those people that through no fault, fault of their own lose their child in an accident or something. I mean, just really that feeling of just in a split second, something can happen to this precious little being. It brings you right into your existential place, doesn't it? This, this is so fragile. The tiniest thing, a windshield cracks and hits you. Boom, you know, it just kills me. It kills you. It ki being a parent kills your heart every day in a way, and you have to resurrect it. Yeah. Mm. I will say the strongest experience of that exact feeling that you're describing was in the days and weeks to come after I first had my son. It was like my heart was just getting blown open and it was excruciating. And I would find myself just bawling about how much I love him. Yes. <laughs> and I know it. It, it, was, yeah. it was almost crazy making. Oh, it is crazy. I mean, I remember this day that my wife had been overwhelmed by our daughter. And finally, she got her to sleep, right? And we had like an hour or two to ourselves. My daughter would not go to sleep early usually, but she'd fallen asleep this one evening early. And what did we do for the next 90 minutes? We shared photos of our daughter and talked about our daughter and my wife was just it is it's like in certain spaces you only have to say my wife went through a phase when my daughter was under 15 months where if you even told her a story from the newspaper about someone neglecting a child she would tear up i'm still in that phase yeah it I, is I because, yeah that might yeah. be like a lifelong thing for me well <laughs> well because well because and that is and that 
the power of that insight and that compassion that's arising in you as a result that's what i have to find in my work with people who are in their 40s 50s 60s even 70s having to help them go back and look at that monstrous event that violence that abuse that time they were chased around that time that the person that ought to have loved them became the most threatening thing you know listening to a grown man cry and tell me that he wasn't sure he'd physically survive his own childhood that his father might beat him to death you know to go to that place with people and try to find the purity of that little being and bring them forward through time i'm like um a spider bringing that thread that ariadne had you know i'm trying to lock it on to that point and coax them back to here and it is incredible and it and in it's very moving and actually you know it's a sign that a part of your heart is alive that you feel that way and what do i have to do i could if i felt it to your level like in the preciousness of that maternal love i wouldn't be able to do my work i hold it like a classical father stance loving but that little bit more detached loving but that little bit more like well what are you going to do about it little little being you know rather than what you know my wife is straight away how what can i do for her and i'm a little bit like well what are you going to do about it mm. and in a way that's how that's how i hold my work with adults it's like a kind of loving paternal quality yeah but i think it's beautiful you feel that way but you know that those things do happen and how how do you take it in how do you take it in that that's happening to some sweet little children right now on a scale that would blow our minds it's unbearable it is unbearable that's and why we are here having this show and having these conversations exactly um, it's why i've dedicated my life since i was 22 years of age to psychology astrology hypnotherapy healing modalities working with people um to at least be part of the possibility of a redemption of that pain you know to be part of a potential solution rather than to be part of the problem as it were yeah and i can't really think of anything more noble because of my particular affinity for what we just discussed um i the visual that you gave us about throwing the lifeline to the little one inside of the hurt adult and bringing them through time yes that in itself is kind of a gorgeous healing image and and people can begin to do that themselves in a way if you can be <clears throat> honest enough in your life in relationships when people find patterns where in adult intimacy the same thing keeps happening people are cruel in the same way people betray you in the same way people leave you in the same way or you leave them over and over it's almost always because of something that happened to that child it's almost always because of an, a developmental incursion something that shocked into that child's world that they've absorbed and sometimes it's like mission impossible you know you have to lower yourself through the little tunnel to get to that point in that person's life and other times it's more like a gesture i often encourage clients at that particular phase in a process to literally put their hand out in the moment to put their hand out in a loving gesture and put that hand towards that little being and say something like i will never i will never leave you i will never let you down because it's the child within the adult that's so often hurting and that so often turns sincere parents into people having a catastrophe or falling apart. It's the unresolved child within the adult that causes so much pain in the world, really. Right. And I used to, in the beginning of the show here, have a piece of the intro that would say, you know, this is for you, whether you're a parent or a grandparent or an auntie, or if you have an inner child. Because nice, yeah. my, my experience has been that the more softness and awareness we bring to how we can support our children, we have 
that same opportunity to do it for ourselves. And in fact, that's part of the big mission, in, in my opinion, is that we're, we're kind of raising ourselves while we're raising our children. And you know, when we talk about some of the, the characteristics of the areas in there, which I happen to have, I've gotten a lot of healing and talking about what it's like to raise an Aries moon child just for my own self. Yes. Because it's helped me understand me better and bring more softness to my own nature or bring something to me that I didn't get when I was a child and just understanding why the pain is there. It feels like it just softens all the edges. I mean, you're talking about a very, a very profound process. And I think, I think having a child can be reparative of even the damaged parts in ourselves, but only with that awareness. The danger is when people are unconscious of that, what could have been reparative becomes punitive or repetitive of something. And holding that distinction is incredibly challenging because this is the one relationship in the world where it's uneven. Archetypally, it's uneven. It's like with your partner or your friends or even your colleagues, you're trying for some kind of parity, even within the role structure. But with a child, it's always the parent gives and the child takes. Any loss in that on a certain structural level is a problem. And yet within that, the child's love and self-expression is enormously giving to the parent. And that's the thing I, I knew and a bunch of people had been freaked out by being parents before I became a parent, <laughs> how hard it is, the sleepless nights, it's oh, oh, it was so. And of course, what that misses is the enormous redemptive love, that the love is so powerful, the sleepless nights or the getting up, comforting that child having a bad dream is at its best a privilege. I mean, every now and then it's more difficult than that, but at its best, that love carries you. And that love itself is redemptive, isn't it? That love and then the appreciation of the unique challenge of this little being helps recontextualize how you understand how you were parented. People, people, people frequently revisit the issues they have with their own mother and father and recontextualize them through the understanding and sympathy of the challenge of parenting. So there's so many things going on at the same time. Um, but I love the way you talk about it. You're clearly a person who's enormously opened her heart to the possibility of co-evolving with your child, with your son. And, and you're recognizing that even though they're not fully conscious of how they're doing it, your son is leading that co-evolution. I mean, that's almost part of the moon and airy symbolism, isn't it? That his pioneering capacity that, that you allow him to lead your heart and that therefore it's empowering for him to find that assertion capacity in himself mm. it's like we're, we're in this dance aren't we where the child is almost taking your psychic love and using it to build their world they're taking the colors from your rainbow and they're using it to build theirs or build their expression of theirs and if you if you refuse to give it, they have less to build with. And then those those parents that are really hurt by their own childhood can often shut down in the face of the child's needs. If people have been very se severely inhibited in their own early childhood, it's very hard for them to keep giving when the child tests them. Children test you, or they they push into your boundaries, or they they do things deliberately wrong just to see how you'll react. Or, and it's very hard for people who've been hurt like that to deal with that. Yes. So would you say, that the safest and um, most powerful way that we can use astrology to benefit us as parents is to know ourselves better i think it's the in, all, almost always it's the individual understanding that's the most helpful to leap to your child's chart and be trying to interpret your child's chart without a coherent understanding of your own process could be disastrous couldn't it 
And certainly I wouldn't trust all sorts of astrologers personally to look at my daughter's chart. I mean, I'd be quite particular about it because I think even gifted astrologers lay lots of projection onto people through their interpretive symbolism. So I would be very cautious about even having my child's chart interpreted at all until they were kind of a certain age or, or they wanted to themselves or something like that. Um, the, the, the gift, what, what, what's the fundamental essence of why people get into astrology? Because they want to see the meaning in the world. Mm -hmm. They want that felt sense of connection with the night sky, with the, the kind of sense of harmony with the greater life that nature can give you, that studying the stars or planets can give you, that systems of symbolism can give you. So they want that greater symbolic life to connect them to the mystery. Well, the best thing you can do as a parent is to connect to that mystery and let the love within it lead you into being a parent every single day. You know, what did one lady who'd had an absolutely tyrannically abusive childhood say to me once when she was a parent herself, a lady I worked with for a long time, God bless her. She would say, the question she asked herself is, what would love do in my place? This was a lady who'd had such terrible things in her early childhood that sometimes she would take herself into the restroom and physically beat herself. That's how much shame she carried. And then she gave her child, she homeschooled her child, remarkably successfully had this extraordinarily gifted child who went on to do amazing things in the world. But that's what she, that's the pain she had to go through to be that parent. And the process she used to transition from her own past of pain to being that kind of parent was the question, what would love do in my place? What would love do here? If, if love was embodied as this child's parent right now, and it's incredible really I think the redemptive capacity that people have through being loving parents to heal their own past so what is it it's a cliche but it's not superficial to say that the best thing you can do for your child is love them in a really dynamic engaged way you know right. it's not it's not some serene thing like from afar oh, well I love you but you know <laughs> I don't want to deal with you, you know? It's this engaged thing, I'm sure you know, but kids are like, my daughter's like, it's like having a mixture of a, a clumsy dentist and um, some kind of crazy lover, you know? She's like fingers in mouths and, you know, they're just children are in your space, you know? They're mm -hmm. in your space. And you get to push back, you get to be in that space too. And. I don't know, that's the greatest gift, isn't it? Isn't it? It's, it's, it's so simple, it doesn't. And use astrology when that child's struggling at some point in their life, or use astrology to understand the transit, you know? When your daughter got her face scratched by yes. the cat, yes. did you look at her transits after? No, um, but it, it was around her first birthday and she has got Mars in a certain place that would have moved at a solar arc of one year. I was aware of that. There was a kind of Mars component. The funny thing with my daughter is she still thinks this Tomcat's the sweetest thing. We have to chase him away because this Tomcat, you know, I've seen him take a squirrel. I've seen him take a stoat, like fast things. This Tomcat might be old, but he is hardcore and he is not tamed. But my daughter still thinks he's the sweetest thing and would go after him. My daughter loves animals. And my daughter watches TV shows and even the baddie in the TV show, the kid's kind of baddie, she goes, she, she'll often like the baddie, you know? Oh, but they've got a good side kind of thing. And, and it's very interesting for me because that's both her sweetness, but genuinely now this Tomcat could do it again and I couldn't bear that. How do you hold that? Th those are the archetypes of being a parent. That thing you talked about with the bubble, you can't protect them. At the same time, you kind of can, you know, it would be remiss of me to let this Tomcat do it again, wouldn't it? It would be just absolutely remiss. So we chase the Tomcat away, even though the Tomcat used to adore me. We chase him away and we say he's a naughty Tomcat to my daughter, but she still thinks he's lovely. Oh. <laughs> She's got a massive heart for animals, but my God, some of them scratch. And as parents, you, you see this little scar and you're just like, super don't want that to happen again. You know, you just could, it was right by her eye, you know, it was dangerous. 
It's like it could have been very different. Can you? And I, um, the, the final thought, the, the essence to me, being a parent links you to this world ever more powerfully. Because if anything happens to your child, you're clearly, you just see, it, it almost increases your risk. It's like going all in, isn't it? Having a child is sort of like in a poker game, going all in. If life is a poker game, you're all in. You don't get to tell yourself how you'd be fine with the end of civilization or terrible things happen in the world or something. You don't get to do that. Yes. Yeah. Right. As parents, we have a really big commitment to the future of humanity. Yes. You know, it, it's, it's a lot harder to say, well, you know, I'm just going to do this thing and I'm going to die someday anyway. So if it's today, then it's, that's fine. You, you know, it, it really extends the, the vision way past the end of your life in, in exactly. terms of the decision making exactly. process. Well, and it, it just, you extend that safety, don't you? I, I've, I've spoken to many parents who've changed their ability even just to watch violent imagery, for example. My sister, when she became a parent, she couldn't watch violent shows for years. Um, I've watched people change in their reaction, uh, the kind of person that used to, you know, almost like take to the streets and, you know, shout about this, that, and that issue, and suddenly more scared by uh, civil disturbance. You know, suddenly you're just in this world where this fragile, vulnerable being is your responsibility. And in the first few months of life, it's like trying to keep a baby otter alive, isn't it? It's like they can't speak. You don't. They don't have their fully formed personality. You're just keeping this little precious being alive. And I think, yeah, it brings up all sorts about how we live on planet Earth, doesn't it? Both from environmental concerns, but I would say from social and political concerns too. Or personally, I've just become ever more respectful for all its flaws, democracy and the kind of flawed but genuine democracies that you and I live in is just a great preciousness and a blessing mm -hmm. to have just the relative freedom to have your little, your little corner of the world, have relative peace, have relative democracy mm -hmm. compared to when you see what's happening to so many people in the world trying to bring up children and the circumstances that they face. And I think um, the world we've created for all its flaws has this preciousness to it that deserves value. You know, democracy, and I'm, I'm aware we live in flawed democracies, but they are genuine ones. And it's a very precious quality in the world, quite a rare one. Mm. Aren't there so many more questions that I would love to explore just off of our conversation today? And I, I really appreciate the richness and the nuance um, that you've brought to the conversation today. I'm gonna attempt to just pull out some of the key things that stood out to me. Sweet. Um, with this consideration of how astrology can support us. Yeah. So I'm hearing that one of the biggest gifts that we can receive from astrology is to know ourselves and that this extends to our parenting that this is one of the most important thing that we can do as a parent is to make sure that we are fulfilling ourselves exactly exactly that you'd be better off understanding your own chart in a way more powerfully than some attempt to understand your child's chart, especially when they're pre age six or seven or 10 or something that actually you're better off staying with your own growth because that's the basis that will become the basis of their life. How authentic yours is. Right. And this beautiful image that you brought in of the rainbow, you living your full rainbow allows their full rainbow to stay online. Yes. And you're you're bringing in a correlation between that full expression of the rainbow and the unique 
self that we can kind of see through the chart of the child as well. And what I really love that you brought into is just holding it all with a lot of softness and I'm kind of seeing it as a conversation. It's, it, it's something that you can kind of ping off of. You can ping off of the child's chart to be reminded of their sensitivity or why perhaps they're being really pulled in a certain direction. And I can see how that can help us make certain decisions about whether to open ourselves to allowing that experience or making more room for the experience um, or just just having a little more context. Yes. Right? Yes. But, you know, take an example. Say there was an inhibition. Say there's like a Mars Saturn or Mars retrograde with Saturn or something in your own self-assertion, say in someone's chart, and they're concerned then about their child's anger or acting out the first thing to look at is not necessarily your child's chart. Yes, go there as well. Sure, understand the Mars energy in your child's chart. But children will push against where the inhibition is in their parent or where they feel that. Children are dynamic explorers of the holding environment, just like we are. Mm -hmm. So, And the holding environment is effectively us and how we live our lives, how the parents live, how the parents express emotion. So yeah, it's super interesting. I would say always people are in a rush to look at fancy charts all the time, you know, progressions, transits, they can be very interesting or fourth harmonics or these different complex charts. The natal chart never stops being super rich. It never stops you, your understanding of what you're going through. And go to the charts over time very gently, the child chart, you know, the don't bring your interpretive power to a pre six year old's chart or a pre eight year old's chart. Don't do that to them when they're just still discovering. They're in an amorphous flow, aren't they? They're in this endless, just like delight of self discovery. Let's not put anything on that. Let's let them do it and see where they get. Right. And you brought this in earlier, and I've had this conversation in previous episodes as well. There's there's so much we can learn as well about how these archetypes are showing up through just noticing our children. Like I personally saw a whole different side to Virgo when, when I met my son. And as I've gotten to know him more and more, it kind of like blew out my understanding of what Virgo was because I held it lightly. Yes. Because I didn't have enough of attachment to Virgo needing to be super anal and, you know, just like some of the the boxes that are really like well established in our definitions of what the archetypes are and how they show up. And they're not lies. You know, my daughter's a sun Taurus and sometimes her favorite thing is to eat an ice cream watching TV mm -hmm. on the sofa snuggling you know Taurus with moon and cancer but they just they need to be friendly boxes with all sorts of room to add new things to and and that's the, the gifts of the child's experience let's not be afraid to let our children teach us directly without the interface of astrology and then just add astrology subtly to our own reflections upon that yeah I'd say just generally being before astrology the human heart, the human mind, the human soul before astrology. Astrology is a secondary thing. Astrology is a thing that just helps you reflect on how powerful the human soul or the human heart is. Don't put it first, ever, in any part of life, really, would be my advice. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mark. Pleasure. Thank you for taking the time and having this beautiful, candid conversation with me. I've enjoyed it, really enjoyed it. Wonderful, me too. And I see that many of our listeners enjoyed it as well. From from the very first moment, they're already saying, I'm already loving Mark's perspective. So thank you. And where can people find you if they want to learn from you or connect with you? So it's uh, plutoschool.com. Pluto, the planet, school.com or Mark Jones, Astrology for Transformation and Healing. But yeah, on plutoschool.com, there's all sorts of 
free material, blogs I've written, other podcasts I've done and interviews. And then there are a couple of more formal courses, my astrological method and then my counseling skills for astrologers. So yeah, there's all sorts on there. And um, yeah, I look forward to connecting with any of you that, that find that interesting. Well, thank you everybody for tuning in. If you found this helpful, as always, please like it, share it. Um, if you have someone that you know would benefit from this, please send it to them directly. And make sure to subscribe to our podcast and our channel to get pinged whenever there's a new episode. And don't forget, if you haven't gotten already, we do have a free PDF download of the guide to your child's moon sign that goes through all the moon signs. And you can get that over at astrologyhub.com forward slash moon sign. And we just offer some helpful insights on how to uniquely support and nurture your child based on their moon. And remember, when we change the way that we raise our kids, we change the world. See you next time.